everyone could find a seat. Some of you can't see, might have to stand. What a turnout tonight. Thanks for coming. Uh, tonight we welcome back Edna Stubbs. Uh, some of you already know through her portrayal of Belle de Lockwood a few months ago. Tonight she's here to about resurrect the spirit of another important historical figure. And uh, from now on, for the remainder of the evening, she'd like to be addressed as Mary Jemison. So to begin, we're gonna, we'd are gonna like everyone to do some me mental imaging. Please con try to consider what this area would have looked like in 1830. There would have been heavy forests, no roads, only well-traveled Indian trails, and very few people. You've been invited to the cabin of Mary Jemison, also known as the white woman of the Genesee. She's been telling the story of her life to a few people who are willing to listen here at Buffalo Creek. Buffalo Creek was a reservation that's right in the center of Buffalo right now, or it was. Keep in mind that in 1830, the revolu she had seen the Revolutionary War, War, the War of 1812, before anyone thought of women's rights or children's rights. It would be 90 years before women gained the right to vote. Uh, there are still many slaveholders in the North and many more in the South, and this area is on the Freedom Trail. Mary Jemison has lived through close to a century three wars and the birth of the United States. She spent most of her life with the Seneca people and has a unique perspective on the history of our country. Listen carefully to her words. Good evening. I wasn't expecting this many people this evening, but it's very nice to see you. I am an old woman now, almost 90. 90 summers and winters I have lived. And sometimes my old bones, they just get a little cold. If you don't mind, I'm going to cover up just a little. I'm almost 90. But I can remember everything that happened in my life. Well, almost everything, because I'm not sure exactly when I was born. I know where my parents, Jane Irwin and Thomas Jefferson, were on the William and Mary ship coming from Ireland to Philadelphia. But they weren't sure what month it was or what day, so I don't know. And I don't really care what is one day in almost 90 years, right? It doesn't matter. We had a small farm, our family, near Gettysburg. Not too far from Philadelphia, and we enjoyed the first few years in this country. My father was a farmer in Ireland, of course, and everything went very well. There didn't seem too much, to be too much Indian trouble where we lived until When I was about 14, we started to have some trouble with the Indians in the area and the French. And one day, a raiding party came to our farm. They captured my father, my mother, my little sister and brother, Two of my brothers who were older managed to get away and hide, but I never saw them again. We were taken by the Indians. It was a French and Indian party that came. The Frenchmen were the ones who killed a lot of the people in our area. The Indians took a lot of captives including everyone in my family. 
I was really scared. I didn't know what was going to happen. We had heard stories of what the Indians did to people, terrible things. And I had no idea what was going to happen. We marched from Gettysburg to Fort Duquesne. That's called Pittsburgh now. We walked the whole way. Girls, do you think you could walk from Gettysburg to Pittsburgh? You think you could? It took a long, long time. Actually, months. Because there was nothing but forest. There were a few trails that the Indians knew about, but that's about 400 miles. It was a long way, and during the walk, they separated me from the rest of my family. That made me even more scared because I wasn't sure what was going to happen. A few days later, I did find out. I saw some of the Indians in the party preparing their scalps to give to the English. Or the French, depending on who would pay more. And I noticed the red hair of my mother and a smaller one of my sister. And I knew the others had to be my father and my brother. Now I was truly alone. No family, nobody to care for me, nobody to protect me, only myself. I was very afraid, but when we got to Fort Duquesne, I had a very nice woman say to me, you have been sent by the Great Spirit to take the place of my son. He was killed in a battle about six months ago and you are going to be my daughter. <clears throat> I didn't know what that meant, but it did sound better than being alone. And besides, I didn't have a choice anyway. I went with her. She told me her name. It was Ginondi. And she was wonderful to me. We moved to Weishcho, which is in Ohio, walking again all the way. And we stayed there for three years. And she taught me all of the things that I needed to know about being a Seneca. Because she was of the tribe of the Senecas. She taught me how to grow the crops that the Seneca women grew. She taught me how to make the sap and the hominy to make food for my family. She taught me how to prepare the skins that the men brought back from hunting for clothes. And she taught me how to take care of myself. That was a wonderful thing. And I thought everything was going to be the same for the rest of my life. I probably should have known better, but when we were in Wishto, a Delaware chief named Shinanji asked me to be his wife in the Indian way. As if I had a choice, I didn't. I had no choice. I became his wife. We stayed at Weishu for about three.
three years. The first year, I had a daughter. She died about two days after she was born. And I was sick for months and months afterwards. Nobody knew what was wrong. But I had, I just could hardly move. And my sister had to come and take care of me. About a year and a half later, I had a son. And he was strong and beautiful to me. And I named him after my father, Thomas Jemison. You see, in the Indian way, the women have control of their children. They name their children, and they can name them what they want. Also, you know, I, I always wondered about the white culture because men in the white culture treated their women and children, their wives and members of the family, like servants or slaves even. They had to do what they were told. They had to do all the meals. They had to cook. They had all this work to do. I didn't have that much work to do. I had time to sit and think and do other things that I wanted to do. But as I was growing up, I saw in the white families that the women had no power. In the Indian families, the women have the power. They own the home. They own the land that belongs to the family. And they have control of their children. They never can be taken away from them. And the most important thing, if you think about it, I think it's the most important thing, the women decide who the chiefs are going to be. Imagine that. The women vote on who the chiefs are going to be. And they have been doing it for centuries. You know why they did that? Why would you think they would let the women decide who were going to be the head of the tribe? Anybody got an idea? They're smarter. They're smarter? <laughs> Could be. But there was a very good reason why. <laughs> why they did. The women brought up the children. So they knew what the young men were like. They knew if they were wise. They knew if they were honest. They knew if they told lies or didn't. They knew all the things about the young men. So when it was time to pick a chief, they know, they knew who was the best man to be chief of the tribe. I think it's interesting, people always ask me, why didn't I go back home? I did have a chance later on, but I didn't want to go. I had no home. And in the white culture, my children would not be accepted. They would not be accepted. I wanted to stay with the Senecas where my life was good. <laughs>
They asked Shininji if I could bring Thomas and go there, and he said, yes, that will be fine. You go, and I will come to be with you within about six months. So I put Thomas on my back, and we walked from Ohio to Gardo Flats, which is the Genesee Valley. I have spent a lot of my life walking, <laughs> a lot, and I think it's made me able to live to be this long age. We got to the Genesee Valley, to the home where my Seneca's family was, and I stayed there with them for two years. I waited for Shinanji to come. He never came. And finally we got news that he had died at Wishton. Now, I'm a widow with a small child. He's five now, but he's still a small child. Now I have my Seneca family, and they did something wonderful for me. They found me a wonderful husband. A wonderful husband. A Seneca named Hayokatu. He was 50 at the time that we got married. I was about 22, something like that. But he was not an old man at 50. He was a young man at 50. And we had six children. Six wonderful children. Four girls and two boys. And he adopted Thomas as well. Thomas became a Seneca. What a wonderful time we had for the first years of our marriage. Our children were growing. I was spending a lot of time with them. Now, let me tell you their names. They're not important, but names are important. My four girls were Jane, Elizabeth, Betsy, and Polly. They were all names that I remembered from my family. And my two boys were John and Jesse. Jesse was the youngest. My pride and joy, I loved Jesse. I loved all of my children. They were all very good to me. <coughs> Unfortunately, when my children started growing, we had a big trouble in our country. It was the French and British War. I, I'm sure you've heard of that war, although you probably heard of it as the French and Indian War. No, it was the French and British War, and my Senecas helped the French. They went to Niagara, uh, Fort Niagara, just so you know what I'm talking about. They went there to, to, help, to help the French who had uh, taken over the fort from the British. Unfortunately, it didn't work out very well, so a lot of our young men were killed. And it was a terrible time for all of the tribes of the Haudenosaunee. It was a very bad time. Finally, when the war was over, we had 15 years of peace. What a wonderful thing. I hope you all get to enjoy 15 years of peace someday. <laughs> it was a wonderful thing. We could, my husband and I, we could be at home with our children. I could till the, the corn and do all the things. I needed to teach my girls what to do, how to till the corn and make the hominy and make that sap for corn cakes. I had to teach them all of those things and how to make clothes for their children when they grew up. And my husband, of course, was out teaching 
Our sons are three sons, Thomas, John, and Jesse. First of all, how to hunt, how to kill, how to get the animals that we needed for food. Second of all, the part that I didn't like a whole lot, he was teaching them how to be warriors. How they could be warriors if another war came. Unfortunately, another war came, as they always seem to do. We called it the whirlwind. I think you call it the Revolutionary War. There was a large problem among the Haudenosaunee about the war. They couldn't decide whether they wanted to fight for the British or the Americans. They had a big powwow and they decided finally that they were going to be neutral. They would not fight for either side. Of course, that made everybody angry. Lots of people among the Haudenosaunee as well. But it was decided. Until Brant came back. He was a Mohawk chief and very much in with the British. As a matter of fact, his sister was the wife of Colonel Johnson, who was the manager of the whole eastern side of the British Army, and he was based at Fort Niagara. So all of our people knew him, and had worked with him at one time or another. And Brad decided, no, we are going to go with the English, and he took tribes with him, including my Seneca tribe. They fought for the British during the Revolutionary War. Only the Oneidas and the Tuscaroras fought for the Americans. During the Revolutionary War, my husband, who was much older than most of the war chiefs at that time, because he was in his 60s, he became second to Brant with the Indian <coughs> Army. A war chief, and he took two of my sons with him to battle. He settled us in Gardo Flats in, in the Genesee Valley, and we stayed there. And most of the time during the whole war, most of the time when the war parties would go through the Genesee Valley east to have a raiding party or to have a battle or whatever they did, I never talked about that with my husband. I really didn't want to know what he was doing. They would stop at our home and we would make sure that they were fed for at least a night and then they would go on and when they came back, they would stop again. So my home was basically the center of the tribes that were fighting for the British. Do you think that was a good thing for me and my family? Who won the war? The Americans. The Americans won the war, not the British. We all thought they would, especially with us on their side, but they didn't win. They didn't win. And after the war was over, there was a, a big meeting at Fort Stadwitz. And Corn Planter, who was the chief 
of the Seneca went to that meeting. Now he knew what was going on. He knew that the Americans were going to demand the land. He knew that. He didn't want to give it, but we were defeated. And when he went to that <coughs> meeting at Fort Stanwis, he was pressured into giving all of the lands west of the Niagara River to the Americans. Now that left us some land in New York State, but there were thousands and thousands of acres that Seneca used west of the Niagara River. When he signed that pact with the Americans, he made a lot of enemies. But he was a person who understood that he had no choice. He had no choice. And I always felt that the, the Senecas who used to call him names, and, and it was really bad, although they didn't vote him out as chief, he still stayed as chief of the Senecas. I felt that they were being very short-sighted. When you lose a war, you lose as much as the other side can take. That's the way it works. It's better not to go to war. But all people seem to have not figured that out yet. I hope they do in the future. I hope they do. Corn Planter was a wonderful chief. During the, I have to tell you a story about him. It's kind of interesting. Corn Planter was half white. His father's name was John O'Bale, and of course his mother was a senator. And his mother took him away from his father when he was small. He had never seen him. During the Revolutionary War, he knew where his father lived. And on a raiding party, his people captured John O'Bale and brought him to Corn Planter. What kind of a reunion would that be? What would you think it might be like? It's interesting. I want you to understand how the Seneca people and all of the Haudenosaunee treat their relatives, the people in their family. The raiding party brought John O'Beal to Corn Planter, and Corn Planter said, Hello, my name is John O'Beal as well. You are my father. I would like to take you back to my people so I would have some time with you before I die. Would you like to come with me? <coughs> John O'Bale said, I don't think so. My home is here. My family is here. I need to stay here. So Corn Planter told his party to take him back to his home, leave everything in one piece, and he said to him, I will not see you again, but I appreciate the fact that you are my father. That is what the Indian people feel about their families. They're the most important thing to them. Their children, their cousins, all of their relatives, they are very important to them. I want you to understand that because I know some people don't. We had a couple of other chiefs. I don't like a whole lot. I 
I'm sure you know the name. Red Jacket. Yes? You've heard of Red Jacket? Yes. He was an interesting man. As a young boy, he had been a person who took notes from Fort Niagara to Fort Schlosser. From Lewiston to Niagara Falls. He was a runner. And because he does, did such a good job, the British gave him a red coat. That's how he got his name. And he wore it for the rest of his life. It was a little tattered and torn by the time he passed away. But he wore it because it was a totem. It was a symbol of who he had been and who he was. A person who believed the British were the best. And he also believed that the Indian people should not try to be white. That was not a good thing. He spent a whole lot of time telling people they should not try to be white. They needed to keep things the way they had always been. To do the hunting, to travel from place to place, and live the life of their people. That was his way of telling people what to do. And he was an orator. He was a good speaker. He spoke a lot, and he spoke for a long time, and he had a lot of people who listened to him. But he wasn't a warrior. He was never a chief. Never. He did do some fighting, but it was kind of wishy-washy fighting for him. Another chief that you may know about is Hiawatha. Anybody know who Hiawatha was? He was a person who brought the tribes together way in the past, ancient history, but he brought the tribes of the Haudenosaunee together for peace. It never lasted. One other chief that I knew quite well was Handsome Lake. He was the one who started the idea, after he had been ill for a number of years, that the Seneca should now become more like the white people. He had this dream, this vision, that the Seneca <coughs> would live on farms, they would have cows, they would do everything like the white man does, and they would become rich like the white man did. Red Jacket and Handsome Lake did not get along. You can imagine that that would be true. And it was amazing, after the meeting at Fort Stanwix, the people of the states were trying to decide how much land they were going to give to the Haudenosaunee in New York State. Not too much. Not too much. And Red Jacket was saying, we're, we're not going to take, we're not going to do that. It's our land. We said west of Niagara. Oh, well, we're going to change our tune now. They said, uh, we'll, we'll just give you places to have in New York State. There was a lot of confusion and a lot of things going on during that time. And one of my cousins, one of my husband's cousins, came and asked me if I thought I would like some land. Hayakutu had died, and we were still in the Genesee Valley, and I knew the place very well, very well. And he said, give me some landmarks in the Genesee Valley for land that you would like for yourself. I thought, all right, I'll do that. And I gave him four landmarks, two in the north and two in the south of the Genesee.
see that. And he went to our tribal council and to the states to get me that land. And who do you suppose tried to stop him? Red Jacket. I told you I didn't like that man. <laughs> he went to every single council meeting and said, we're not giving any land to a white woman. And of course, he would orate and orate about the fact that I was one and my cousins, my people, the chiefs of the Seneca would get up and say, wait a minute, Mary is an Indian. Her children are Indians. She was married to two Indians. What are you talking about? She's not white anymore. She's a Seneca. She is a Seneca. This went on for 12 years. 12 years. Red Jacket tried to keep that land away from me. And finally, finally, you, you'll have to live. Finally, the people of the states said to Red Jacket, we well, you know it's not the Indians that are giving her this land. It's the states. We're saying she can have this land. And when she gets it, it'll be Indian land. <laughs> it was very funny. I wish I could have been there to see his face. But of course, I wasn't there at the tribal council. But I'm so glad all of the chiefs stood up for me and I got my land. That's the proudest moment of my life. I received this land tract. Here it is. I hope my family still has it. Because I want to tell you how much land I got. 18,000 acres of the Genesee Valley. <laughs> yes. It belonged to me and my family. And I spent most of the rest of my life there with my children, with my grandchildren. We had wonderful times there. You know, I used to make, I'm, I'm sure some of you have seen these, I used to make these for all of my grandchildren, corn dolls, and, uh, <laughs> and now I'm making them for my great-grandchildren. And if I live long enough, Maybe I can make some for my great-great-grandchildren. Who knows? I don't know how much longer I have. But we had wonderful times there at Gardo Flats in the Genesee Valley. But there came a time when there were too many white people there. Just too many. As I said, they had at one time said that I could go back uh, my son Thomas actually said he would take me, but they wouldn't let him go. The Senecas wanted him to be a chief in the future. They wouldn't let him go, and I wouldn't go without him. So I stayed with the Senecas. I was more comfortable there anyway, much more comfortable. And finally, towards, I think it was about maybe two years ago, I had given land to all of my children, to all of my grandchildren, at least 80 acres to each of them. Some of them got more, depending on what they were going to do with it. Because we believe if you have land, you have to work it. Don't understand these white people who own land and have never set foot on it. It makes no sense to me. Why do you want to do that? Anyway, I gave away all the land, as much as I could. Grandchildren, cousins, anybody, I gave it away. The rest I sold. And I decided to move back to Buffalo Creek. That's where you are with me tonight. I really didn't want to go there. Because you see, Buffalo Creek is where Red Jacket is. <laughs> we don't get along that well. Even now, even after everything that has happened, 
We stay away from each other here at Buffalo Creek. We have, uh, we have times when we're at a council meeting or something. I usually don't have anything to say, but he always has a lot to say. And I stay away from him. And we have been pretty comfortable here at Buffalo Creek. But the problem is, now there are a whole lot of white people coming to Buffalo Creek. It used to be just a small group of Senecas, but now the white people are coming. And I know they're going to keep on coming. They're going to keep on coming, and I can't even think about what it's going to look like in 50 years. Say nothing about 100. But I hope it will be good. I hope it will be okay. And I hope our people, the Haudenosaunee, will be able to get along with all of the white people that have come. I pray for that every day. Every day. And I hope that is what is going to happen. Now, I died on September 1st, 1833, three years after this little talk this evening, 92, I didn't make it to 100, and on October 1st, 1872, I was married at Buffalo Creek, in 1872, they decided they were going to take me back home. And they removed what was left of me, which was probably not very much, to Letchworth Park. And if you go to Letchworth Park, you can see about where my home was in the Genesee Valley. And my grave is now there. And I hope you all will keep in mind that people can get along with one another even though they're different. They really can. Thank you. No. <laughs> I didn't think so. I wouldn't think so. 